In this video, I am going to tell you about electric flux. Now flux was the fourth quantity that I told you that uh, it would be important not to mix up with the other quantities. Okay, so we had electric charge, electric field, um, electric force, and electric flux. So um, this is going to be that fourth different quantity that's closely related to the others, but also distinct. So electric flux is defined in this way. So um, we use the symbol phi. So this is a Greek letter. It's the equivalent of F. And we'll have actually different kinds of flux, so I'll put a little E to distinguish it. Um, the flux is equal to E times A times cosine of theta. Okay, so let me walk through those parts in a little bit of detail. So um, to remind you, this thing is the Greek letter phi, um, sometimes pronounced phi. Uh, it doesn't matter. People pronounce it both ways. Um, so this is the symbol that we use for um, flux of any kind, and the E distinguishes the electric flux. E is the magnitude of the electric field vector. A is the magnitude of the area vector, or if you want, just the area. And theta is the angle between the electric field vector and the area vector. Okay, so um, first of all, this should remind you a little bit of some quantities you've seen before. So for example, um, you had that work is equal to a force times a displacement. I don't know if you use D, but some, some variable like that to represent the displacement times cosine theta. And that's not really an accident. So the reason that that happens is because there are only two normal ways to multiply vectors. Um, and one gives you something something cosine theta and one gives you something something sine theta. So for quantities like flux and work, you get a um, cosine theta in there. For quantities like torque, you get a sine in there. Um, and it just depends on which kind of um, vector multiplication you're doing. So that's just a side note. It's not a coincidence that the same pattern shows up in a few places. Okay. So um, back to flux, what does this actually tell us? So the idea here is that the flux is the amount of electric field that's going through a surface. That's not how that's spelled. Okay, so um, if you have a really strong electric field in the vicinity of a surface, then you get a large flux. If you have a, an electric field through a really big area, then you have a big flux. Um, and then the angle shows up in there as well. Okay, so let's look at a few different cases to see what I'm talking about here. What does this mean, the amount of electric field going through a surface? Okay, so I'm going to start by drawing um, a electric field. And for the purposes of um, this, I'm going to have basically the same electric field all the time. So let's say that I have an electric field that is pointing kind of horizontally. To the right, and I'll draw four electric field. Um, let's say that these are electric field lines rather than vectors, so I'll extend these a little bit to make that clear. Okay, so this is my electric field. And if I have some surface, um, like let's say I have just a rectangular area, 
and this is drawn in perspective. Okay, then as I've drawn this, I have two of my electric field lines are passing through that surface. Okay, so here is my area in red. Okay, so um, from this quantity, if I have an area vector that's pointing like this, and I have an electric field vector at the surface that's pointing in, say, the same direction with some magnitude, then I have everything I need to calculate the flux. I know E, I know A, and I can find the area between these. As I've drawn them, they're in the same direction, so the um, angle is just zero. Okay, so if we want to think about how much electric field is going through the surface, one way to think about that is just counting electric field lines. So I already did that a little bit. I have a couple of electric field lines here. If I had a stronger electric field where I had a lot more lines drawn, then more lines would pass through the surface. Okay, so that's a useful um, tool for thinking about electric flux. So you can think about how many field lines pass through the surface. Okay. Um, and that'll be a useful trick that we'll come back to um, a little bit later. All right, so let's look at how the electric flux um, looks in a few different cases. Okay, so um, when I do um, a case like this, um, it's actually a little easier instead of doing a perspective view to draw a side view. So I'm going to do that now. Okay, so for a side view, I have my electric field like this. And let's say that I picked my area to be in this side view, kind of like this. Okay, so you're looking kind of edge on at this, um, at this shape, and I have my area this way. All right, so in this case, um, the angle between E and A is just zero, because they are pointing in the same direction, they're parallel. So that means since the cosine of zero is one, my electric flux is just going to be whatever that electric field is times the area of that surface. Okay. And note that this is a scalar. So um, the electric field doesn't have a direction associated with it. Um, if I have E and A both pointing to the right, I get a positive flux. If I have E and A both pointing to the left, I still have a positive flux. Okay, so um, that information goes away, like which direction the electric field was when I calculate the flux. All I get is just an amount. Okay, now let's say that I have the same electric field, but I change my area vector. So here's my electric field line. Okay, so I haven't changed the electric field at all, still pointing to the right. But if I rotate my area, so in the side view, kind of looks like this. That isn't very good. Um, here's my area. Um, well, now the angle between the area and the electric field is 90 degrees. Okay, so with that being the case, Um, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero, and that means that my electric flux is going to be E times A times zero, which is just zero. Okay, And that is consistent with the um, counting how many electric field lines go through the surface. So in this case, I had four electric field lines going through the surface. Here I have none. All of them either go above or below the surface, but none of them actually pass through the rectangle I drew. Um, and then the last case, I'll redraw the same electric field again. Okay, so here's my electric field. 
Um, but this time I'm going to have the area pointing to the left instead of to the right. Well, that doesn't actually change what the surface looks like, but um, it makes a difference mathematically. So if I have my area pointing to the left, like this, well now the angle between the electric field pointing to the right and the area pointing to the left is 180 degrees. Oops. Okay, so with a 180 degree angle between them, um, I plug that into cosine. Cosine of 180 degrees is negative one. So this time the flux is going to be um, negative e times a. Okay, e times a times negative one. And we could calculate flux in other situations. So I've drawn three special cases here where I have um, electric field either in the same direction, opposite direction, or perpendicular to um, the area. Um, it wouldn't have to be. The electric field could be 27 degrees from my area vector, and that would be perfectly fine. I could plug it into the formula and calculate a flux. Um, the fact is, though, that in any situations we're going to be looking at, we will only have to look at cases where we're calculating flux in one of these three um, situations. I'm not going to do any calculations where we have to worry about some weird angle. <clears throat> okay, so these three cases are the only ones we're actually going to need to be able to understand for our study of electric flux.